I really felt like God gave me um, another one, Words of Wisdom Part 2. I want to uh, share with you, uh, last time when I talked about Solomon, and I talked about the time of, of the kingdom that, that David, I mean, he was the son of David, and how the, the time of his rule and reign was the closest thing we have on, on the physical earth to his kingdom, what it's really going to look like in the kingdom. And... Uh, when the kingdom gets established. But I want to go back even farther now, and I want us to look at Deuteronomy, because this was after the Israelites went into the land. And this shows the heart of God for us. This shows the intention of God and his heart for us. And I think it's, it's quite amazing. Let me just start by reading. Deuteronomy 4, 1 through um, 1, 5 through 10 says, Now, O Israel... Listen to my statutes and the judgments which I teach you and observe that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God your fathers is giving you. See, that's his heart for us, that we may live, that we may go in and possess the land that he's giving us. Oh my gosh, surely I have taught you statutes and judgments just as the Lord my God commanded me that you should act according to them in the land which you are going to possess. So he says, this land I'm giving it to you, go in, dwell, live, possess it, it's yours. This is my gift to you, this is my purpose for you, and this is a key part. The key part is that I'm going to give you these judgments, I'm going to give you these statutes, this is going to teach you how to live, this is going to teach you, he says, be careful to observe them. Before this is your wisdom. This is your wisdom. Be careful. Observe them. This is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the people who will hear these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord God is to us? For whatever reason, they may call upon him. See, he's, he gives us these statutes. He gives us these principles that we may live, that we may possess, that we may be a testimony in the entire earth to his wisdom, to his strength, that he knows things that are past that we don't understand, and he's good, and it's a testimony. And what great nation is there that has such statutes, and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you this day. Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart. I underline depart from your heart. He says take heed. Because what happens with the human heart, right? Right? We have to remember the goodness of God. We have to remember the good things because they tend to leave us. They tend to depart from our heart. And so he says, take heed and keep yourself. Don't forget the things your eyes have seen, lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life and teach them to your children and to your grandchildren. The scripture says in Psalm 51, you desire honesty from the heart. So you can teach me to be wise in my inmost being. That's what God's doing with us today. We are right now in the classroom of the Lord, and he's teaching us right now how to be wise in our innermost being. So are you ready to sit at the feet of Jesus <laughs> and learn? The psalmist says, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Restore to me again the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to sinners and they will return to you. <laughs> so the word of God must pierce your own heart before it comes out of your mouth, right? It has to pierce your own heart before it can come out of your mouth. He says, create a clean spirit. Renew a right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Make me willing. That's an attitude. That's a heart attitude of obedience. 
Then I will teach your ways to sinners, and they will. That's a promise. They will come. They will return. Proverbs 4, 4 to 6. Let your heart, again, God talking about the heart. Wisdom is a matter of the heart. Let your heart retain my words. Keep my commandments and live. There is, again, him talking about us living. Go in, and that's his heart for us, that we would live, that we would prosper. That is God's heart for us. Get wisdom. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget, nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do, um, do not forsake her, and she will preserve you. Isn't that interesting? They're talking about wisdom as what? A her. A her. And they're talking about her and the female ge gender. Now, they also, the other, there's other scriptures that say that Jesus is wisdom. Okay? And we all know that he was born a male. I mean, so I find it really interesting because we know that, every, see, it was God that made Adam, and there's, there's a teaching now, and I kind of tend to think it makes a lot of sense to me, that before woman was created, he put literally into Adam everything that was male and everything that was female, because every attribute, whether male or female, comes from God, right? The nurturing aspect, the nurturing aspect comes from God. The desire to get your sense of being that you get from your mother, that comes from the heart of God. The desire to call forth, like the male, the male calls forth into destiny, that's also from the heart of God. So everything that's male and everything that's female comes from the very heart of God. And so when he took out of the side of Adam and created the woman, he took out all those attributes that were female, but we really need male and female to represent the full picture of God. Amen. And so I love it that he's talking his wisdom as a her because um, he, will, he will, you'll see later on as I unfold this scripture, how he talks about wisdom almost like he does to a bride. So l l let's keep going on talking about Wisdom, get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her and she will preserve you. That's to me is language. That's like bridal language. Don't forsake her. I have a man who would, will never forsake me. <laughs> and he's had a lot of tests. And he's passed them all. <laughs> and um, and <laughs> anyway... Love her. Again, that bridal language. Love her, and she will keep you. Love wisdom, and she will keep you. Love her, she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing, so therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she will promote you. <laughs> She will bring you honor when you embrace her. Isn't this amazing language for wisdom? I mean, I, I, she will bring you honor when you embrace her. She will place on your head an ornament of grace. A crown of glory she will deliver to you. Hear, my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of your life will be many. I have taught you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in right paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hindered. When you run, you will not stumble. Take firm hold of instruction and do not let go. Again, that language, take firm hold of her, of instruction. Do not let go. Keep her for she is your life. Keep her. She's your life. Wisdom is your life. Jesus is your life. It's amazing. That all, all, um, so, ready for our next road trip? Last time I preached, I gave you 21 
principles of wisdom. I think I've got 21 or 22, so we're on a jet tour. And, and so if you forget them all, that's why we make CDs. And also, I, I have the copies of the principles. So all of those that, like last time, came up here rushing the pulpit for the principles so that you don't have to take you know, furious notes, they're going to be here, and you'll have them. Okay, so first one. What you do is what you believe. Right? It's not what you say. It's what you do. What do you do when crisis comes? That's what you really believe. Right? What do you do when somebody insults you? What you do is what you really believe. How do you react in times of crisis? How do you react in times of fear? What you do is what you believe. Okay, I'm going to move on. The will of God is an attitude, not a place. Let's think about that. We, we, ask, we ask God, God, what's your will for me? What's your will for me in this situation? I just want to do what you want me to do, Lord. I just want to do what you want me to do. And it's really an attitude that God's after. And then he'll do it. <laughs> right? You're in a battle and you're saying, which way do I go? He's after your heart to become a place of the spirit in which truth indwells and the battle belongs to the Lord. Lord. He's after an attitude of heart. When Leonel was diagnosed, imagine going in and finding out by the time you go to the doctor that you're already in fourth stage cancer. You're already in fourth stage cancer and it's a certain death sentence, right? What's your will for me, Father? Should I, am I going home in glory or am I going to stay here and, and, and be around for a while? Well, he passed the test because God produced in him the attitude, an overcoming attitude in which, uh, in which miracles and miracles and miracles and miracles and miracles came about because God was after him to come to a place in the spirit. God was after a place for him to come to in the heart. And it's a place of identity. It's a place of confidence. It's a place where we know who he is to us in this season. It's a place of faith, and it's a place of purity. So the will of God is an attitude. What were the scriptures we just read about Psalm 51? The will of God for us was a clean heart, a pure heart. That's, that's the will of God. It's always relational. Everything he does is relational. Every trial, everything, it's always him taking you to another place in him, in the spirit. The price God was willing to pay reveals the worth of the product he saw. So how dare we say that we're not worth anything? He couldn't have paid a higher price. That shows our worth. That shows our worth. We buy diamonds, right? And they cost thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars because what? They're precious. It's a precious commodity. There's not a lot of them, and they're worth something. We, we spend money for gold. We spend money for land. There's land that has a high price on it. And somebody's willing to pay that price because it's worth it. So we are worth what somebody, in this case God, was willing to pay for us. Do you, can you see the value your life is? Let it sink in right now. Let the revelation of your incredible value that he would give. That could God have given anything that cost him more? Is there anything in all the creation and all the universe that could have cost him more? That is your worth. That is your worth to him. And so this is your identity because the God of heaven that that holds all power, that that owns everything, that there's nothing that can happen outside of him says, This is what you are worth to me. Do you know that we are the gift? We are the gift to Jesus. 
the inside the Trinity is it's a love triangle, and each are each are outdoing each other because in the nature of love, of, in the nature of love is giving, right? If you love somebody, what do you do? You give of yourself, you give gifts, you give affection. In, in the very nature of love is in an attitude of giving. And so in the triune God, in the community of God, is, is giving, 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 giving. The Father wants to give Jesus the highest gift he could possibly think of. Like the highest gift. He was like, okay, I love my son. I love my son. What can I give him? What can I give him? What's the best present I could ever give my son in whom I'm so well pleased? We are the present. We're the present. We are the gift that in the mind of the Father, in the triune God, is what he could think of would be the highest expression of love to his son. We are the gift. A body for his son to indwell. A house for his son to indwell. A family for his son to indwell. To have an expression in all. To multiply the expression of God. We are the gift that the Father gave to the Son to be the highest expression of love the father could think of to give his son. What does the son do? The son says, I'm going to lay down my life and die so that what my father intended will come to pass. See, it's all giving. It's all giving. It's all giving. He lays down his life. He lays down his life so that he says, I, and that's when he said, it is finished. I got her. I got the bride. It's finished. I got her. I got the bride. See, that's why the beauty of the cross and so what does the Holy Spirit do? He never speaks of himself. He's always revealing Jesus, revealing Jesus, revealing Jesus, so that the purpose of the Father, so that the purpose of the Son, so they all get glory. See, that's, that's the nature of God. It's, just, it's love demonstrating in giving and giving and giving and giving. And um, so do you know who you are now? <laughs> you're the gift so let's live like we're the gift right because your self-portrait determines your self-conduct right so if I'm a loser what am I going to act like I'm going to act like I'm a loser right if I think I'm a failure oh I'm just a screw up I'm just a failure what am I going to act like if I think that I'm the highest expression of the love of God that he indwells me, he rescued me, he's forgiven every single sin, that where I go, the presence of God goes, that I, can, I have privilege, that the, he's given me a land, he's given me an inheritance, he's given me a hope, he's given me a future. How am I going to conduct myself if that's my self-portrait? Right? So can we discard the other one and put on this one of, of identity in Jesus? Right? right? Because that's the truth. The other one you're buying into is a lie and you're giving power to the lie. Why? When truth is so much better. <laughs> it's so much better. The scripture says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Do you see yourself as a victim? Or do you see yourself as victorious? <laughs> do you see yourself as an overcomer? Do you see yourself as somebody with royal authority? Do you see somebody as a blood-bought blood son or a blood-bought daughter of the living God? The person of Jesus creates your peace. The principles of Jesus create your prosperity. Think about that one. The person of Jesus creates your peace. We come, everyone comes to God through the one door, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He creates your peace. He forgives you of all your sins. He's the shalom of God, which means everything that makes for your highest good, right? But it's his principles by following what he says that will create your prosperity, that things will go well with you. If, you. if you allow Jesus and then ignore everything he says, 
you really think things are going to go well? <laughs> you really think that if you ignore the God and we, of all wisdom that things are going to go well? So it says in John 1.12, but to all who received him, he gave the right to become the children of God, right? He gave the right to become the children of God. And so we have, we have rights and we have privileges, right? Like, is it your right to have a driver's license? No, it's a privilege, right? If you feel the requirements, you get this privilege. So he's given us the right to become children of God. And there's certain things that are privileges for those who listen and obey. And so you can be touched by God, but it's critically important to follow the instruction to be changed. Change actually happens the moment you step out and obey. And sometimes you're going to go, I hate my life, <laughs> right? Because he's asking you to do something tough. But that's what changes you. That's what promotes you. It's when you obey those instructions, they're vital. The pain of your past will decide your passion for the future. <laughs> Pretty good. He said, what did he say about the woman who was pouring perfume on his feet? He says, she's been forgiven much, so she loves me much. <laughs> right? And we heard this past weekend when at, the, at, the, at the New Heart Conference, boy, gut-wrenching stories of what some of these overcoming women have gone through. I mean, the enemy had designed things to destroy. And God says, you're going to be my greatest testament of glory and overcoming. Amen. Right? And they're passionate. Oh, my gosh, were these women passionate? I mean, you can't say anything about Christina Collins other than that she's a very passionate woman, right, for the Lord. You can't say that. You have, you have to say that about Maria Passwaters. That there's, she's an intensely passionate woman. Why? Because she's been through hell. She's been through hell, and God has picked her up. And so she loves with an intensity, and she has an intensity to impart because her past is filled with pain that God is redeeming. He's not wasting one thing, not one thing in her life, not one thing in Christina's life, not one thing in my life, not one thing in Allison's life, not one thing in Leonel's life, not one thing in any of our lives is he wasting. God disguises his greatest gifts in the most flawed vessels. So only the most passionate qualify to release them. <laughs> that is challenging, but it's true, right? But that is why we can say, sinner, you know, come to the cross. That was the first song we sang today. Come to the cross, there is room. No matter what you've done, there is room. See, because God has put great, 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 great gifts in you. And somewhere there's passionate people that love him and that will see you through all of your rough edges, will see the diamond placed in there, and they're going to call it forth. And that is my prayer for this church. My prayer for this church. And I think we're on the road. I think we are a place where we see the gold put in people. That's why the ministry team lingers until 4 o'clock in the afternoon almost every single Sunday, because we value every single person that comes in these doors. And we say we're going to speak to the treasure that is in you, and we're going to call it for. And we're going to help disciple you. We're going to help mentor you. And yeah, you, you're, you, know, you may make some wrong choices here and there, but we're going to still believe in the Lord, in God for you. And we're going to st still keep praying for you because we believe that what he began, he's going to finish. Amen. And that's my hope that we become a place where... And he actually, he spoke that. I know I, know I mentioned this on the other sermon, but I'll re-mention it because I think we need to be reminded. He said, um, he said we were going to get wounded prophets because we were going to be a place that could restore them. Do you know what a privilege that is? It's challenging. It's hard. But it's a privilege when God says, 
I want to send them to you because you will love them to wholeness. That's a privilege. That's, a, that's awesome. Ah. The broken become masters at mending. <laughs> so that's, that's part of our inheritance is that it doesn't matter. See, isn't that hope? I don't care how screwed up you are. The power of the blood of Jesus and the power of the risen Christ can come and make you now a master at mending others. So there's no shame in where you've come from. Matter of fact, that's going to be your greatest testimony. Amen. Everyone can come to the cross. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Because the size of your enemy determines the size of your reward. So you've had two tons. You've had two tons come against you. Well, now you're going to have two tons of authority on the other side to squash that guy and mess with his head. <laughs> and your whole life will be a testimony of messing with the enemy's head. All your life. Because two tons have come against you, and my God is a just God. He says, I have, I have these scales, and they're balanced. And so what the enemy has meant to destroy you, what did he say to Peter? The enemy has asked permission to sift you. But when you are done being sifted, what? He will lift up your brothers. Right? He will lift up his brothers. He will, God is going to refine him like gold. So the size of your enemy. So if you're... If you're Facing some huge trial right now, guess what's waiting on the other side? Right? What's waiting for you, Lourdes, on the other side of this? It has to be something huge. Because what, be, what could be harder than what you're going through? Right? So what does God have for this woman and this family and, and over her children and her children's children? Amen. Anger yeah. is the birthplace for solutions. <laughs> is that hopeful? <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna amplify. Because what, there's, there's reasons we get angry, right? We get angry over injustice, right? We get angry over injustice, right? We also get angry when, our, when somebody disrespects us, let's be honest, okay? But God uses anger. He uses anger. Now, when something comes against us, You have a responsibility to the Holy Spirit. When you are feeling very frustrated, when you are feeling very angry, you have a unique responsibility and opportunity in the Holy Spirit. You see, when you are that in touch with that level of emotion and passion, if you take it to the Lord, it becomes the most powerful intercession. And you have a choice at that moment. You can, because anger can be incredibly destructive or it can be incredibly empowering. So it's an opportunity. Don't just think of anger in itself as sin. Think of it as an opportunity to go deeper in the Lord. Okay? So what you do is you take that. For, for example, say I feel, I'm feeling disrespected in my home. This is the personal one. Okay, I can take it in prayer and go into a level of passion and intercession that causes me literally to shift my home and bring in the glory of God. And everything that was meant to bring dishonor and to bring a lack of peace and to bring division in my home can literally be flipped on its head as I go into a lower and lower and lower place and receive the rhema word of God for that situation. And I allow it to change me. I allow it to form me. I, I allow not the circumstance to determine the victory in my home, but who I am in God and what he is going to do in me. And I allow that anger to fuel my passion. I 
yielded to the Holy Spirit, and it becomes the changing and driving force, and I obey whatever instruction he gives me. Okay? <laughs> okay, but when it's the other anger, for example, did I click it? Anger is simply passion requiring an appropriate focus. And so look at, look at the example of Carl and Caro. They are angered by the trafficking of little girls taken off the street, okay? Sold into slavery and used and used and used and used and abused and abused and abused and abused and it's happening to thousands upon thousands of girls and they're angry at that. And they have a passion and they've, re they've decided to turn it into a focus and become a force to rescue, to annihilate that thing, right? The problem that infuriates you the most is the problem God has assigned you to solve, right? <laughs> How, why do you think so many kids that are abused want to be psychologists? Because they want to try to understand why what happened to them has happened to them, and they want to make sure it doesn't happen to anybody else, right? That's, what, that's why psychology is so important, why, why, why so many kids from broken homes are interested in that. They don't yet know the Lord. They don't yet know that just understanding why something happens is not the cure, that you have to come to the cross, because the only way to put a death you will, you know, they will, uh, understanding the why helps a little bit, but it's, it's not the final answer. So the problem that infuriates you the most is the problem God has assigned you to solve. Or another way to say it, what saddens you most is a clue to what is God has assigned you to heal. Again, I go back to the illustration of Carl and, and Kara. They're saddened. By these girls. I can look at Diana and say she's saddened by the homeless on the street that are caught in drug addiction, that are lost. She's, it, it grieves her heart. And so she is empowered to do something about it. I'm going to go on the streets and I'm going to preach the gospel. Lewis and Sonia, they're saddened by families that are struggling and they want to be a witness and a testimony, so they are willing to sacrifice time and a lot of time and more time and more time and more time and their own money and their own finances to make up these bags of groceries that they pay for and that they pray over and say, God, would you give me a divine appointment with somebody who doesn't know you? I want to be Jesus with feet on, with hands to those because it grieves me how many people are struggling and they just need to hear about you. I think of Jesse and Martha with the, with the heartbeat of Miami. They, they are, they're infuriated by the statistics in this city. You know, the statistics in the city, you know we have double the abortion rate of New York in Miami. We have double. Do you know we have double the abortion rate of Los Angeles? They're angry at that, but they're also saddened by that. But they have allowed their anger and they've allowed what saddens them, allowed it to be fueled by the Holy Spirit to become the very solution for those things and to be his healing force in those very areas. Never discuss your problem with somebody incapable of solving it. Go. Oh, I'm sorry. I hit it. It just didn't move. Very good. Okay. Never discuss your problem with somebody incapable of solving it. Right? Right. Just think about that. Now, 
I discuss my problems with my friends who are also filled with the Holy Spirit who will join with me before going before the throne of God, hearing the Lord with me to obtain the victory. Okay, so it doesn't mean they have to be able to solve it completely. Oh, you know, I'm just going to run to you and you got all the answers. But somebody who doesn't respect who you are, who doesn't know, understand the nature of what you're designed to do, you know, why would I discuss my problems? Uh, my problems with them and become a source of the enemy pointing at me and accusation. It's not wisdom. You think Solomon did that? You know, when he was ruling and there were gajillion issues, you think he went with people who had no clue how to <laughs> help him? No, he went to the Lord first and then he had wise people around him and he went with somebody that could help him with the, with the solution. And so that's just a bit of Wisdom. <laughs> Loneliness is not the absence of affection, but the absence of direction. Think about that. When you're feeling alone, when you're feeling like nobody understands you, when you feel like whatever. You know, one time I was feeling very frustrated. I knew God had a future assignment for me, but I felt like I wasn't living it now. And so I, I knew that, you know, I had a destination, but I was, I was here. I wasn't here yet. And I had to pass all my tests here before I could go on to here, right? But so I was frustrated. And you feel like a square peg in a round hole. And God gave me an attitude adjustment, <laughs> like as he frequently does. And he said, he said, Kathy, I mean, he boils things down super simple for me. Really, real simple. He says, are, in this place that you're at right now, are there people around you that I'm asking you to love on? I went, yeah. Yeah, there's always somebody to love. And so wherever you're placed, you, can have, you have an assignment, you know? And... and you don't feel alone if what you're consumed with is God's purpose. And, and when you have that, like this week, um, I was full of the word of God because I'm preparing this message. And, you know, as I get to, as I'm preparing it, I get the revelation. <laughs> and so it's just sing, it's in my spirit and I'm seeing things ahead of time and I'm seeing the worship, and I'm seeing how the songs flow, and I'm seeing how the message gets preached through the worship and through this and through that, and I'm praying for all the other stuff to break out. But there's no room for loneliness because I'm consumed with the Lord and his purposes, and I'm driven by that, and I'm not thinking about me, myself, and I. <laughs> so loneliness is not the absence of, of affection, but it's the absence of direction. Because there's always somebody to love. That's what I think. The seasons of your life will change every time you use your faith. <laughs> every conference I do, I have to walk in faith, believing God for something in a place I've never had to walk in before. Never knowing how it's going to turn out or if God's going to show up or if people are going to show up or if I'm going to go into debt or there's like a million, million, million questions. But every time I exercise my faith, we all go corporately to another level. Yeah. <laughs> we all did. Last week, we all went to another level and he rewards those things. And um, one of them was uh, the planting of this church. I mean, that required a lot of faith. That was like hearing God and staking your entire life, and not only your entire life, but the, but the lives of all your children, the lives of your, your, your money, your finances. I was throwing it all into the pot saying, okay, I'm going to plant a church, and if I fail, I fail. And you'll still be there. And if I make it, I make it. Or, or say, what, what about when you release somebody into ministry? trusting that God is operating in them and that they get, can go for it, right? That's exercising your faith too, right? These are saying, I believe in God in you. So that's an exercise of faith. So I, then I get to go to another level. And then there's always, of course, giving extravagantly. <laughs> using, using your faith to give something. You know, God... 
And when, when you want an, an uncommon harvest, he will ask you to sow an uncommon seed. So I'm really, 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 really curious about what God has for you, Mary and Jose, because what an uncommon seed you guys sowed. I mean, m- many of you may know this already, but I got to repeat it. Um, God told them to give away their house that they paid for with the contents to another family, and they obeyed God. That's, that's an uncommon seed. Anybody else? Anybody else in this room? God told you to give away your house, and you did it too? It, that's an uncommon seed, which means they will reap an uncommon harvest. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, when you ask God for a miracle, He will always give you an instruction. Right? Can be an out. He can a- He can ask you to do. Um, sorry, I, I just hit this thing. Um, he could ask you to do um, a simple thing. Or he can ask you to do an incredibly difficult thing, but he will give you an instruction. Um, think about when the Israelites were trying to take Jericho. <laughs> I would say that that's an unusual instruction that he gave them. They looked like idiots. They were, they were you know, <laughs> marching around this thing every day for seven days. And then on the last day, they blew all these trumpets. I mean, they needed a miracle. They needed, you know, they needed to take this city. And he gave them an instruction. It was pretty bizarre. Hey, but it worked. <laughs> it worked, and those walls came crumbling down. You know, it's happened, I shared last time about, you know, the first building and this building. We had instructions and we followed them. And so now we, we get to move into these buildings and reap. But sometimes it's like I've been praying for my kids. Sometimes it's a simple instruction. I'll be praying for my kids and God will just say, he'll show me things in the spirit. He'll say, your daughter went through this. Pray over this and break this. Your, you, you know, your son is going through this. Pray over this and break this. So it doesn't always have to be some humongous thing. Sometimes it's a, it's a small thing, but it's important. Everything God tells you to do is important. Like I, I mentioned last time, Mary's letter, the, the incredible things that God has done over a, a simple instruction as of the writing of a letter. But he'll, when you need a miracle, he will give you an instruction. And sometimes it's quite insane. But I'll just tell you, like recently, I have been praying for my kids and God has showed me incredibly, incredibly, specifically how to pray for them, especially in regards to my daughter. And um, our oldest son um, started his own chocolate business. He makes organic chocolate. And um, we really felt from the very beginning that that was a God idea. Who doesn't like chocolate? Who, who, um, and organic chocolate, healthy chocolate, chocolate that a diabetic could eat because it doesn't have sugar, it doesn't have corn syrup in it, it's made with agave syrup. Who doesn't like chocolate? And then on top of that, he put curative things in the chocolate, like take this chocolate for joint pain. Oh, that's a really tough medicine. Let me see. You know what I mean? So he came up with 31 different recipes for chocolate. And, and, and he just plowed away and plowed away and plowed away. And he would go to fairs and he would get accounts and somebody would copy his thing and his packaging and he would lose all that business. And he would be, he would, he just, he would, he would go up and start to prosper and he would go down and he would go up and he would down and he he would start to prosper. And we invested because it wasn't enough just to pray and bless our son and say, I believe in you, go for it. But we invested. When he, got, when he needed molds to buy chocolate, we'd send him the money to buy the molds. When he needed supplies and order chocolate from Venezuela, we would send him money to buy the chocolate. You know, and we invested in his business. Well, um, he called us last week. And, and we know that he just got this big account. And he got this big account with this one market that said to him, okay, can you make chocolate, but can you also make lollipops, like without 
corn syrup in it. So he never made lollipops in all of his life. And he made the lollipops and they came out great and the store loved them. And so he said, we want, all your, we want all the, you to make all the chocolate for our store and we want you to make all the lollipops. Okay, can you make gluten-free cookies for us? And he goes, sure, you know. So he was a raw foodist for five years. He wasn't a baker, but he wasn't going to turn down business. So he, who does he call? He calls our daughter to make the cookies. My daughter, God is dealing with, shutting every door. She's um, practically unemployed. She doesn't now qualify anymore for unemployment insurance. And God is closing every door, forcing her to come back to the family. And so my son, my son offers her a job and says, you know, can you make, can you make these cookies? So she said yes, and she did, and the store loved them. So now he has all of the lollipop business, all of the chocolate business, all of the cookie business for this, this particular store. And initially, when he got this account, he goes, Mom, I'm, I'm so happy. I'm going to be making about $4,000 a month off this one account. And we were so proud of him. And he goes, he, he called me this week and he says, Mom, it's way, 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 way bigger than that. I'm going to make, I'm going to make six figures this year, Mom. <laughs> and I'm going to help you get to Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> so God is, God is so good. So the clearer your goals, the greater your faith. And remember when Pastor Gushirum Jeremy came, I want to get the order of his name right. Remember he really challenged us on faith and said to be really, really, really specific you know, because that nebulous thing, oh God, I know you can do it, that doesn't give him honor and glory. But when you, when you say, when you're specific, you ask him for a specific thing, it's, it's, it's a demonstration. You're out there, you know. And so I want to give you the testimony. You guys have no idea what birthday gift you gave me last week about the Ireland thing. I mean, you know, she just said, so the, said Christina just spontaneously during the ministry thing says, this woman's supposed to go to Ireland. Would you dump the money at her feet? I mean, what an outrageous thing that's never happened to me in my whole life. But you guys don't know the, the, story, the back story, so I'm going to let you in on the back story. And I apologize in advance that you've heard this a thousand times, honey. <laughs> he, he's like, I start telling this story because to me it's a great faith story. And he's like, not bad again, honey. <laughs> I forgot. Oh, good. I'm so glad. May God give you a fresh, may it be fresh to you right now. <laughs> anyway, to me, this is a, tr- I love this story. We heard the Lord say, plant this church. Okay. And we were at a conference and we went forward for the invitation. And in my husband's brain, because right, God speaks and then your brain kicks in and says something else, right? You start with the, um, but how could that happen or whatever, or whatever your butts are. And um, so God God says, God says to him, uh, I want you to plant a church. And in his brain, he goes, I'm too old. And then right from the pulpit, and some of you are saying you're, you're too old. And God is saying you're not too old. And, and so, you know, how funny is that? Like, right as he's thinking it, you know, out, out from the pulpit comes, you're not too old. So we, we, we meet with our leadership. We say, we're called to plant a church. We're going to go plant a church. And, we, and, the, and the pastor of our church in, in which we were on staff, or my husband was on staff there, says, I'm in agreement. You're supposed to plant a church. And so he is preparing to run his first marathon ever. Never been a runner all of his life. We do a 5K run as an outreach to the community, and he gets it into his brain, I'm going to run a marathon. And at 47 years of age, he decides he's going to run a marathon. And he trains eight or nine months. And, on, and guess what day the marathon is on? It's on his birthday. His 48th birthday is the day of the marathon. Okay, so I am reading all about Ireland and the history of Ireland while he's preparing for the marathon. And it, everything I read fascinates me and because, see, there's, there's destinies over nations. 
that are irrevocable. There's callings on nations that are irrevocable. There's a calling on the United States of America that is irrevocable. There's a calling on the nation of Ireland and every other nation that is irrevocable. It's, it's in the DNA that God established in them, right? So I'm reading about the history of Ireland because I have Irish blood in me. Ralph has Scottish blood in him and probably a little bit of Irish too, but we know Scottish. We can trace our lineage for, through a friend, both of us, him to the 1700s, me to the 1500s, wow. okay? So I'm reading about the history of Ireland and I'm blown away about the true story of St. Patrick. And St. Patrick was born into a Christian home in the, in the 300s, okay? He's, um, the Catholic Church hadn't, you know, really like gone through Europe. He's born in Europe in the, in the 300s, and he's raised in a Christian home, right? He's 15 years old, sleeping in his bed, and evil people come and take him right from his bed and put him into slavery. So how would you feel? You're sleep All of us, many of us have children here. How would you feel if somebody come and took Rachel in the middle of the night and she's, no, you have no idea. You know what I mean? What, what do you feel as a parent? Like one of our kids gets taken and they're gone. You don't know where they are, okay? So he's taken. And what happened was there were a lot of kids being taken then and they were taken from Europe and then they were transported to Ireland on a ship, and because um, Ireland's an island, and it's freezing, the climate's very, very cold, and they didn't feed them very much, so many of the kids just died, and they didn't care. They were just slaves. So most of the kids just died because they didn't take care of them. They didn't give them blankets and food and everything like that. So he's stolen. Uh, he's ripped out of the, his family. He's now a slave. He has nobody. He's a kid. He's a kid. He's freezing. He's hungry. He has no one to turn to but God. So he, he's out to put to pasture to watch all these sheep. And he just starts to talk to God hundreds of times a day, praying and just communing with the Lord hundreds of times a day, just praying and praying. It was his only friend. The Lord was his only friend. So he just starts this relationship with the Lord and he's communing with God day in and day out, year in and year out. Six years go by. He's still alive, still talking with God. And, I, on, and when he's 21, God says, you're going home tonight, start walking. So, you know, there's guards. But he just obeys where the Lord tells him to go. He starts walking, he starts walking, he starts walking. And he misses every guard. Inexplicablemente. He, <laughs> he, he misses every single guard. He gets to a shoreline where the, where the boats are. And I don't know how, I don't remember the details of the story because he had some sort of money. It probably wasn't very much, but he had something. So he approaches some sailors and he says to them, I want to buy passage back to the mainland. And so they take his money, and they say, eh, we ain't taking you. So they steal the money, and he starts to walk away, and he says, God, you're the one that told me I was going home. And he starts walking away, and then they, they go, oh, all right, come on, we'll take you. So he gets on that boat. Now, I don't know if you know about this time in history, but there were these barbarian hordes going through, and they, like, would ravage places like ravage. They would kill people. They would steal all the goods, all the food that was available in those areas. And so it's not that long of a voyage. I don't know how long it took them, but whatever. When they got there, they were hungry and people had just gone through and there was no food because everybody had just been devastated. And so they're hungry, these sailors, and this is a super, super rough crowd. And Patrick says, my God is able to make food appear where there's no food if we will just pray and ask him. And these rough sailors hold hands with Patrick and say, God, can you, will you make food appear? And the minute they get done praying, a herd of swine comes running through and they kill and they eat. 
Lechon. <laughs> so, imagine six years later, your son walks back in the door. Your son, and he's alive, and he's well, and God is taking care of him. You have your son back. He's 21. He's back. God has brought him back. God has protected him. He's back. So imagine their joy. So, some, so he lives in Europe for years and years and years and years and years and years. And then at one point, God says to Patrick, I want you to now go back to the land of your slavery and set that place free. <laughs> you know how old Patrick was when God gave him that word? He was 48 years old. I, I was reading that when my husband is preparing to run a marathon, a miraculous thing, and we're getting ready to plant a church, another miraculous thing. And people in the 300s didn't live, like, they didn't have these lifespans like, you know, oh, 80 years old, right? That a lot of them, like, they lived to like 26 or 40, you know? So it got, God calls a man to go back to a nation at age 48 to begin his ministry, and he takes, God gives him 30 years of life, and he takes the whole nation. So who were we to say, we're too old? <laughs> who were we to say, we're too old? You know? And so this is, this is the, the seed of Ireland in my heart. You know, I started to read about Columbo, and he did all the, uh, the, the miracles of Jesus, literally. He did every single miracle Jesus did in the 500s. He lived in the 500s. And so there was this very, very historical, important thing that, that Ireland was called to do because um, as years later, as, um, as Europe and all these nations were being ravaged, all the books were being held there. Oh, the other thing that Patrick did was um, they were all illiterate. Nobody knew how to read. And he established these, ho these godly houses through the whole thing and taught them all to read. And so they transcribed all the great works of literature, all of them, including the scriptures. And, all, and, they were, and the, the thing that, that was known for Patrick and this other guy, Columbo, was their love. Love is a palpable thing. Love is such a palpable... He could take that nation because God filled him with love. And... Uh, so years later, as all the books were being burned, they were all preserved. See, there was a, there was a divine destiny over Ireland. There's a, there's a divine destiny as we know over Israel. There's a divine destiny as we know over us. You see, each nation has a very strategic, important thing. And then years and years later, um, if you read the history of Ireland, it's like so tragic. It's so, it's heartbreakingly tragic. I mean, there were... There were Hordes that came in and like murdered every priest, like murdered them all, burned every single church to the ground. And, it, and it's just a story of year after year, century after century of ravage, of ravage, of ravage, of ravage. And that my, my heart was just like gut wrenched. And in my heart, I, I want to go because I hear how beautiful it is and I feel an identification. But I also, I, there's something in my spirit that wants to touch ground there and pray that the God of heaven who's calling is irrevocable, something of the worship. I want to get the impartation from that land and also to impart into that land something that God's given to me. And so I told the Lord, talk about clear your goals, the greater your faith. I told the Lord, see, last year, on February 20th of last year, I turned the big 5-0, half a century and I said, God, my gift, I want you to give me, <laughs> is I want you to send me to Ireland between my 50th birthday and my 30th anniversary. Well, my 30th anniversary is April 21st. Okay? 30 years, Ralph and I together. So I gave God that window. That was my goal. That was my faith. And look what happened last week. Look what happened last week. You guys dropped money at my feet to the tune of almost $1,300. You guys gave me a present of almost $1,300 at my feet, which is enough pretty much for the airfare. I still, you know, I still need some, but 
I mean, what a setup. What a, what a setup. I mean, God, God just blows me away. So um, the greater your goals, the greater, the clearer your goals, the greater your faith. Okay. <sighs> Endurance demoralizes your enemy. <laughs> you know, when you're in a season of warfare, the best thing to do is to retreat into your values. This is the time to go into, step into a place of the spirit where you know who you are, where you know whose you are, and you retreat into your values. If you're in a place of warfare with another person and there's all this division and all this misunderstanding, what you do is you, reach, you go into, your, into a place of the spirit, you go into your values, and you start relating to each other like crazy. And you start listening to each other's hearts. You just listen to the heart of the person. Because I guarantee you that we may disagree on vision, but the enemy loves to choose where the battle is going to be. We don't let him choose the timetable. You see, he wants, it, he wants to exacerbate it and make it all come to a head right now. But if you will retreat into your values, into who you are and whose you are and who your neighbor is, who your friend is, who your coworker is, who they are, and you start relating to them like crazy, then we win. <laughs> Because, see, it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And so as we resist him calling the shots and we retreat into our value system of who we are, that we have this unconditional love, that the love of Christ has been poured into my soul and that, uh, that greater love is no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends and we retreat into our values, then we win. And it, so there's, in life, there's seasons of warfare and there's seasons of blessing. In seasons of warfare, that's when we go into our value system and we relate like crazy. We pray together. We get the same mind. We, we make sure that love is solid. We make sure all things are good. In times of blessing, we work like crazy. Okay? And that's the time when buildings get built and ministries get launched and, and we do these works into the street. And in times of blessing, there's this great increase and it's time to work. Okay? In times of warfare... You know, we, we, go into our, uh, we go into our values. So, um, your reaction to greatness reveals your humility. And that's the test of whether there's still insecurity in you or whether you can rejoice at somebody succeeding. You can rejoice when somebody else gets a promotion you can rejoice when favor just gets poured out on them. You can rejoice as they become great. You can tell. And you don't have the need to find the flaws in them. Oh, they're great, but they've got this. You know, you don't have to point out to everyone else their flaws. See, that, that tells whether your heart has been purified by love, that, that we can rejoice at some other people's success. Because your significance is not your similarity to another, but your point of difference to one another. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? I, I look at the leadership team in this, in this church, and, and it's so diverse. We all have these diverse gifts, but they fit and flow together so great. I mean, when we first planted, my husband was this incredible... He is this incredible preacher. I mean, I've been married to him for 30 years. I've been hearing him preach for over 30 years. I still learn something new every time that man opens his mouth. I'm still learning something new. That's a pretty great preacher to, you know, that I've heard. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, the first time he ever gave me the pulpit, um, I was petrified because I'm like going, I'm not a good communicator like him. I'm not like him. I don't go into the word and go so, so, so profound. And, and the Lord gave me this picture of these two little girls' shoes. And I went, little girls' shoes, what is that about? And he said, I'm not asking you to fill your husband's shoes. I'm asking you to be my little girl and let me use you. And I never forget that now. I'm not supposed to be him. See, my significant is not how similar I am, but my point of difference, what 
what I add to the picture is the same when we pray for people. He's so prophetically gifted. And he'll start to pray for somebody and he'll get part of the picture. But then I come along, I get the second piece. And when I'm faithful to deliver the second piece, then he gets the third piece. And so the person getting ministered to gets really, really blessed because our gifts dovetail. And it's the same way like when we started this church, like, um, you know, we had, we had the worship and we had the preaching, but we had this desire for really, really, really powerful Holy Spirit ministry. And it didn't really come about until the Alvarez's came. And, uh, you know, I, I know I say repeat things, so excuse me if you hear it, you've already heard it. But, you know, we used to think there were butt magnets on you guys' butts, you know, that, that your butts were, mag- <laughs> were stuck to the chairs because we would give an invitation to come forward and receive prayer. And everyone, nobody would come forward and we're like, okay, I guess... The you know, whatever. And um, they came their first Sunday and the entire church empties out for the front. Literally, the entire church emptied out to the front. My ministry time was two and a half hours. And because their significance is not their similarity, but in their point of difference, you see? So there's, there's place for everyone's gifting because God wired you and made you different than anyone else. Okay, last one. I know, it's been a lot. (laughs) Money is merely a reward for solving problems. (laughs) But that's the truth. That's the truth. Think Think about, you know, who invented the automobile. We had a problem of transportation. How do you take people? Think of the person who, in the Wright brothers inventing, you know, the flying machine, you know, getting people from, we can travel the globe now because money is a reward for solving problems. And, and I think about, um, you know, the, the thing that, the, the social network movie that came out about, about here's this kid who, there was this simple idea. I mean, um, MySpace was already invented but they wanted a way to be able to accept a friend or to say no to some so that you ha- would have control over the exclusivity and all this kind of stuff. And, and so this guy is the youngest billionaire in the world because money is a, re- is a reward for solving problems. That's why Bill Gates is one of the richest men in the entire world because money is a result of him solving problems. So Colossians 2, 2 to 3 says, let your hearts be in, oops, oh, sorry, you did it for me. Let your hearts be encouraged, be knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, in whom the Father and the Son are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Revelation 7:12, the scripture says, All the elders stood around the throne. And the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces. Oh, I'm sorry. There, thank you. They fell on their faces and they worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the 24 elders asked me, Who are these who are clothed in white? And I said to him, Sir, you are the one who knows. Then he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb and made them white. That is why they are standing in front of the throne of God, serving him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will live among them and shelter them. They will never again be hungry or thirsty. They will be be fully protected from the scorching noontime heat. For the lamb 
who stands in front of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away all their tears. So it is wisdom, it's the wisdom of God to worship God.